the great news of the gospel. We continue our series. We are now in Romans chapter 4, looking at the second half of Romans 4. A lot we've seen already has to do with righteousness and faith. Abraham and David, they were credited with righteousness. It's not about what you're doing for God. It's about what he did for you. It's about his word and the fact that he's a truth teller. He's not a liar and that you can count on him. And that when he says you're righteous by faith, that ought to be good enough. That's enough for me. Is it enough for you? And so we continue in Romans chapter 4. He says, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. By faith, in accordance with grace, do you see those expressions? We're saved by grace through faith. What he's saying here is this gospel is all about believing God. And when you believe God at his word, when you take him for his promises that he's given you, and you put your confidence in what he has said about you and about his own son, then what happens is you get to take advantage of the gospel in its entirety. You get to take advantage of the plan that was predestined before the foundation of the world. You enter into the great news of the gospel. It's called entering into God's rest in the book of Hebrews. And here, it's this word of righteousness, the power of the gospel message that is found by being right with God for free having your sins not taken into account. The best news on the planet is now yours to enjoy through Jesus Christ. He continues, he says, As it is written, A father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. I love how this verse ends because it reminds me of creation. I mean, doesn't it make you think of creation? That God calls into existence things that don't exist? Remember, we have an origins problem when it comes to creation, right? Uh, we have to believe that something comes from nothing. And that's what this verse is saying, that God causes something to come into being that never was before. This is the answer that the scientists have been looking for. They've been trying to explain how matter can come from non-matter. They've been trying to explain how a, a living cell could come forth from a non-living cell. And the answer is it can't, not without God. And so there are some, uh, well, some references here indirectly to creation, but also God is calling into existence your eternal life with him, your righteousness coming out of nothing, coming out of nowhere. You didn't deserve it. You didn't do anything to achieve it. You don't have any right to it. It's not your, your birthright or anything, and yet you get to become righteous and holy and blameless you become a new self. So God is speaking and causing life. He's breathing into you the breath of his spiritual life in Jesus Christ. He's calling into existence something that wasn't there before. And he's giving life to the dead. Do you hear that? That's what real righteousness is. We've talked about this even last week. That real righteousness is imparted righteousness. It is shared. It's when God infuses you with his life. And when you get his life, you get righteousness. And so he's talking about giving life to the dead. And that's what we were. While we were dead in our sins, God made us alive in Christ. We see a very similar expression here. God is a life giver. And there we were in Adam, 
Our problem was not just uh, lying and cheating and stealing. Our problem wasn't just our behavior. It wasn't just what we were doing. It was our deadness of heart. It was our addiction to sin. It was our nature and our identity. We had a core problem at the center of our being. And so God says, I'm going to give you life. In fact, that's what Jesus said, right? I've come that you might have life. Not just a behavior improvement program, not just forgiveness for when you mess up, but life infused in you through the person of Jesus Christ. Wow, pretty cool. When you think about the gospel and the power behind it, I mean, those early Christians, they weren't willing to be tortured and killed, crucified upside down, dragged from their homes just for some sort of judicial righteousness that is in heavenly bookkeeping. No, what they were passionate about was the fact that they were filled and sealed with the life of God, that Jesus was alive from the dead and he lived in them. And it's the same for you and me today. I mean, there you are. You're walking evidence of the resurrection. You are a walking testimony that Jesus has come up out of that tomb and that he lives inside of you today. Look at you. You're living under grace. You're free in an atmosphere of beautiful liberty, the liberty of God's gospel. And yet, you don't end up sinning like crazy, setting world records for sin. Why not? Because there's a life that sustains you. There's a life that indwells you. You've got a new heart. You've got a new spirit. You've got new desires. You've got a new influence. And He will never leave you. So you are walking evidence. You're a walking testimony that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that He's alive today living in you. In hope against hope, he believed, that is Abraham, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. In hope against hope. Do you see this? He's going to tell us what he means by that. But I mean, first, he contemplates his own body. He goes on to say, you know, I think, uh, uh, Abraham probably concluded that his body was as good as dead. And then he even says that. Paul even says that about Abraham's wife, Sarah. He says her womb was dead. Never say that to a woman. Never. But Paul, he gets away with it in inspired scripture. But seriously, whether it's Abraham contemplating his own body as good as dead or Sarah not able to have kids, you know what he's saying. There was no glimmer of hope. There was no glimpse of uh, any hope at all. And even though everything on the outside looked like there was no chance, he says, I'm going to believe God. I'm just going to trust him that I'll be the father of many nations, that somehow we're going to have a kid, and somehow this is going to transpire because God said it would. So why do I make such a point of this? Because, I mean, look, look at you. You're a frail human being, just like me. You've got nothing about you that seems ultra-spiritual or super-powerful in the spiritual realm. You're weak and you're frail. Your body experiences illness. One day you'll die. This life is temporary. You have limitations. Look at you. And yet, something comes out of nothing. God speaks life into you. And out of this earthen vessel comes this amazing treasure, Christ in you, your only hope of glory. That's what he's saying. There, it's almost like no hope was on the horizon for you and me. We would live and die, living 98 years or whatever it might be, we would live and die and experience nothing but an average human existence and then whoosh, no more. And yet, we have crossed the line We've gone somewhere that was unexpected. We've entered into a life that we knew nothing of. We now participate in the divine nature. 
we're now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We now have a treasure just beneath our skin and bones and everything that everybody calls our humanity. We have something deeper and greater now. And so when there was no hope and it didn't seem like anything new was on the horizon, we put our mustard seed sized faith in Christ and boom, he gave us his life, resurrection life, a whole new way to be. And you're a child of God, the living God, the creator of the universe, and you're his kid. And suddenly you're experiencing that same humanity, but in a whole new way. There's a depth and a richness to it like never before. You're the same person on the outside, the same eyes, nose, and mouth, the same basic personality, but something has happened to you. Something has been fundamentally transformed at the very center of who you are. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead. Since he was about a hundred years old, and here it comes, the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, get this, it says, I almost laugh when I read it, and I'll tell you why. It says, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Are you kidding me? You're going to say that Abraham didn't waver, and furthermore, that he was fully convinced, fully assured? Give me a break. Do you not know the story, Paul? I mean, hello, do we have to review the, the Old Testament and go back to what actually happened? Do you remember the part, you know, about the other woman, Plan B, where there was uh, another woman and a child just in case as a backup plan? Abraham didn't waver. Give me a break. He was fully assured what are you talking about, Paul? And you just want to shake him, grab that apostle and say, Brother, what have you been drinking? I love it because it shows us God's perspective on humanity, God's perspective on Abraham, God's perspective on faith, and, interestingly, God's perspective on you. You know why? Because God is looking back at this timeline of Abraham's life. And sure, what Abraham felt were like huge peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys and successes and failures. God looks back at that and it's nothing but a ripple, if not a straight line. He says, look at Abe. He didn't waver. Look at Abe. What a life. What a faith. Look at Abe. And you know, God looks at you the same way as if you've never sinned a day in your life, as if you've always believed God perfectly, as if you never waver, as if you're always fully assured. You know why? Not because of your actual performance, but because, get this, because you're a believer. And that's nature talk. You're a believer at heart, even when you don't believe. You're a believer. Even when you don't perform perfectly according to the faith, the faith that you now have in Christ, sometimes you experience doubt, you experience emotions that make you feel dirty and distant, and you're not sure what to think, and the thoughts swirl through your head, and you're like, oh no, what's happening to me? Did I stop believing? Why do I doubt so much? And you know what God's thought for you is? You're a believer. You're a believer because I made you one. I took out your unbelieving heart and I gave you a believing heart. I took out your unbelieving self and I made you a believing self. You're a new creation. You'll never stop loving Jesus. And you are a believer at the core of your being. God looks at you as if you never waver, as if you're always fully assured. That's the message right here in Romans 4. It's amazing. We get 
overwhelmed with the stress of our recent performance. How did I do on Friday? And how did I do on Thursday? And look at me on Wednesday as my performance dipped into a deep valley. And God's got that eternal perspective. He's looking at hundreds and thousands and millions of years. He's looking at timelines that go into eternity past and eternity future. And he looks at you and he says, there's my kid, a believer, someone with a new heart, a believing heart, someone who will never stop loving me. That's the truth about who you are. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. We talked about this last week. It's true. I mean, Abraham, he got righteousness credited to him, and so do we. Let's not forget, we've had righteousness credited to us as well. But recall that something greater has happened, something greater than credited righteousness. We've been credited with that righteousness, but we've also been given righteousness. It's been imparted to us. It's been shared with us. It's been deposited inside of us in the person of Christ, and that causes us to be a new self, a new creation, born of the Spirit, born of God. I don't get it. I don't get how people can say they're born again, and then five minutes later say their righteousness is not real. I don't see how you can say you're born of the Spirit, and then five minutes later say, well, you know, I'm righteous, but only judicially, only positionally, only in God's heavenly view of me. But if we're talking real, like real, then I'm not righteous. But you said, you just said you were born of the Spirit. You just said you're born again, that you're born of God. What does God give birth to? God only gives birth to real righteousness, and you really are righteous. That's why there's nature talk all over Romans. God says you're a slave of righteousness. A slave of righteousness, that's not judicial or positional. That's about you and your nature. That's about who you are and what you want. So, do you see it? When you're born of God, you're really righteous. When you're born of the Spirit, you're really new. God wants you to know this because it matters in the moment of temptation. It really matters. Judicial or positional righteousness sounds really good, but what does it do for you when sin is knocking at the doorway of your mind? What is that kind of righteousness that's only credited? What does it really do for you when the tempter comes? What I'm talking about is your new passions, your new desires, your nature, your heart, who you really are as we open you up and look inside. When you realize your righteousness is real, there's power in that. It transforms how you think and you act. It matters because then you realize when nobody's looking and you can do whatever you want, you've realized what you really want is pretty good. God is good, and he made you good, and he gave you good things to walk in that are a perfect fit with your good heart and your good self. You're righteous, and it's real. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. So Abraham got righteousness. It was credited to him, but not just for his sake. It's also for your sake as an example, as a pattern, as a forerunner. Jesus is telling us something here that Abraham is the forefather, the forerunner, the, the prototype, you know, when they make a new automobile, a lot of times they'll work five and ten years ahead, and they'll come out with a prototype, and it'll show up at the car show in Chicago or Dallas, and everybody will ooh and ah, and they'll look at the prototype, because it's the first one. The assembly line is not ready for it. They're not making it in mass. It's just a prototype. 
Abraham is a prototype for all those Old Testament believers. And you know, Jesus is a prototype, the last Adam. Have you ever thought about why they call him the last Adam? Well, the first Adam was a prototype, a prototype of death. And Jesus is the last Adam, a prototype of life, resurrection life. And there's an assembly line. And after Jesus, there are all of these children of God, new creations that are born of the Spirit that show up on that assembly line. And just like at the Ford Motor Company where they're cranking out model after model after model, it all starts with a prototype. And so Abraham, he serves as a prototype of sorts, a human who's made righteous by believing. But then there's an upgrade. That's what I'm saying. There's a new covenant upgrade through the cross and the resurrection. Yes, we are made righteous by faith, but there's an upgrade. Hebrews 11 says we have something greater than those Old Testament people had. They were righteous by faith, but not like us. They were righteous by faith, but they didn't have this born-again experience. Remember, Nicodemus didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about because he was talking about the upgrade. The disciples didn't know. Jesus said, you got to wait, wait for power from on high. And so they tarried in the upper room and they waited and Pentecost comes and boom, there's an explosion of resurrection life within humanity. It's the upgrade. It's finally here and it's better than anything they had ever experienced before. Abraham was a prototype of righteousness by faith. But Jesus... Jesus is the last Adam, the ultimate forerunner, the ultimate prototype as many sons and daughters of God would follow. None of them being God, don't get me wrong, we're not God, we're not Jesus, we never will be. He is God and we are not. But do you see how privileged we are? that he would share himself with us, and that he would let us participate in the family. I mean, the scripture says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brother and sister, that we get to be in the family, we're invited to the table, we get to feast on the goodness of the gospel, the greatness of the gospel, together, because Jesus made it possible. He was the forerunner experiencing human life, human death, and then resurrection life that's given to us at no charge. Paul goes on and he says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. The two sides of the gospel What is the finished work of Christ? You see it summarized right here. The cross has a purpose and the resurrection has a different purpose. Both are essential. You don't want to miss out on either one. And this verse right here, verse 25, encapsulates the whole thing. Do you see what's happening? The gospel is more than forgiveness. The gospel is more than cleansing. The gospel is more than you getting your debt canceled. The gospel is not just death, but it's resurrection. And very clearly, right here, the Apostle Paul says, Jesus was delivered over that he died. Why? Because of our sins. And what does his death do? It washes them away. By the blood of Jesus, our sins are taken away, remembered no more. God doesn't keep them into account in any way, any shape, any fashion, you are forgiven, past, present, and future, and that's great. That's really great. But it's only half of the gospel message. Jesus didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the tomb, and he was raised, this is what it says, he was raised for our justification. Now, do you remember that word in this series? Justified means righteified, right? To be justified means to be made righteous. So, what is this verse saying? It's saying that he was raised so you'd be righteous. You have resurrection righteousness. 
Do you hear this? Do you see it? The words in this passage, they scream something so important. Your righteousness is not fake. It is resurrection righteousness. Jesus rose from the dead, not just to show off his power over death. I mean, God had already shown off his power over death. Lazarus, come forth. That was power over death. Lazarus rising out of that tomb. God has power over death. Great. Then why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? Why didn't he just die and make a sacrifice and go immediately to heaven? He was raised from the dead to give you life. He was raised from the dead to make you righteous. You have resurrection righteousness. You've been righteified because he was raised. Do you see this? The cross, so important. The resurrection, even more important. You can't have one without the other. It was God's plan all along. The two sides of the finished work of Jesus. He died for our sins. He was raised to make us righteous. And that righteousness is real. It's resurrection righteousness in you. Finally, I want to finish this message today with one verse from the upcoming chapter. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see this? This is the conclusion to everything we've been saying. It's everything you've ever wanted you're okay. You're at peace with God. He likes you. He's not trying to teach you a lesson all the time and bring down his wrath. We're saved from the wrath of God. We're at peace. God's not mad at you. He's not trying to fix you and improve you. He's not in love with a future version of you. You're right with him. And because, look at what it says, having been justified, because you've been righteousified, you have peace with God. You know, I thought peace with God was just about the blood. You know, the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness. Because I'm forgiven, I'm at peace with God. Well, that's how it works with other people, right? Would you say you're at peace with your best friend right now? Maybe he or she has forgiven you recently. So you're at peace with your best friend, and that's great. And that's how we operate as humans. They forgave me, and I went to them, and I asked them for forgiveness, and they said, yes, I'll forgive you. And then you said, great, we've been reconciled. We're at peace again. But do you notice what causes the peace here? It's not just forgiveness. What causes the peace here is that you have been righteousified. You've been made as righteous as Jesus Christ. This is more than forgiveness and more than cleansing and more than reconciliation. Look at you. You're not just a, a zero. You haven't been taken from the negative 10 to the zero. That's forgiveness and cleansing that would bring you to this point of zero. But you have been brought all the way up to a 10 out of 10, no longer negative, no longer neutral, but a 10 out of 10, righteousified, justified, right with God for free. So God's thinking, here's what he's thinking. Hey, what's not to like? Look at you. You look great. You're the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ. That's the message of Romans. Romans is a road to righteousness. And if you've already traveled that road, then you are in the land of righteousness. You've entered God's rest. You're supposed to be counting yourself alive to God, alive and right and forgiven and cleansed. And because of all of those truths, you are at peace with God. Do you see this? Do you see his smile? The message is he loves you, but even more, he likes you and he lives in you. And he'll never leave you. He'll never ditch you. He's not going to abandon you. You're good with him. You're more than good. You're at peace and you're right forever. And Jesus did it. Let's thank him. Father, 
We thank you for this message of righteousness for free. If you did it, it has to be perfect. If your son died, that sacrifice has to be perfect. If he rose from the dead, whatever that was for, it had to be perfectly done, and it was. You've made us perfectly clean and close and right and unified, one with you. We thank you, Father, that we do have a beautiful treasure in these earthen vessels of ours. We thank you that we carry your life. We are so amazed at this gospel, how powerful it is, how life-giving it is. Most of all, we just thank you for Jesus, the grand success of Jesus Christ on Calvary. We thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.